G'day, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're gonna take a look at Jeju Flight 2216, the go around decision the pilots made from short final 01. We're gonna take a look at some of the factors that would have been considered at the time, why it's a complicated decision to make, and why it's important we don't prejudge or try to assess what's correct or incorrect in terms of decision making, noting the investigation will pour over this very, very closely indeed. To recap, Jeju Flight 2216 from Bangkok to Muan in South Korea crashed just on three weeks ago on landing and sadly resulted in the loss of 179 lives with only two survivors. This is one of South Korea's worst ever aviation accidents and it's something that's gonna take months, if not upwards towards a year, to get to the bottom of in terms of release of a final accident report. On this channel, we look at pilot performance, pilot learning and pilot mental health. If you enjoy a deep dive into topics like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button below. The way I get better on this channel is by listening to your feedback, so please make your comments known below. Please let me know what you appreciate, what you think I can tweak. That's how I learn, that's how I improve. Before we dive into the video, I just wanna say I'm not a crash investigator. This is not a formal analysis of the accident. This is my thoughts based on my experience for a couple of reasons, and I think, first of all, public knowledge. I think the public deserves some insights from experienced pilots so they can help understand some of the factors at play in serious accidents like this. I think flight crew around the world will be breaking down and analyzing this accident and it's worthwhile delving into this on a technical basis so that crews can have their discussions within their own airlines or their own operations, noting that nothing that I say will override the authoritative operational and technical documents or the instructional expertise within your own operations. Lastly, I have seen some comments attributing blame or trying to get to the root cause of this incident at such an early stage. This is not the time for that. This is the time to show our support, to show our respect for our colleagues in the aviation industry in South Korea. Okay, let's get into it. In this video, we're gonna start by taking a look at stable approaches, what they mean in aviation terminology and why they matter. Next, we're gonna take a look at go around decisions and at the flight path from the ADSB data we have for Jeju 2216. We're then going to look at the aerodynamics and the extra power that's required in a landing configuration and how that would be affected if there were damage on one or both engines. Lastly, we're going to look at pilot decision-making and the sort of decision-making framework that most likely would have been employed by pilots in a short time frame, just as the Jeju crew faced. Okay, to start off with and to recap from the previous video, we can see here a diagram of both the timing and the flight path indicatively of Jeju 2216 lined up to land runway 01, making a turn onto what we believe is a left, left turn onto a right downwind for a right pattern to land runway 19. Uh, and importantly, a decision not to land on 01, but actually to position to the right, so a go around decision at this stage. Uh, flight data we have here from flightsafety.org, importantly comes from ADSB, not from any of the aircraft, not from the aircraft cockpit voice recorder, or from the flight data recorder. We can see here at around point one, which was uh, 8.57 and 24 seconds, the altitude was steadily decreasing, airspeed was steady, and the rate of descent was relatively steady also, prior to some disturbances occurring of some type, perhaps correlating with a bird strike. And then the rate of descent varying, initially decreasing, then increasing prior to what appears to be a go around uh, attempt, and then the subsequent go around so a stable flight regime and then some perturbations and then the aircraft dis discontinued that approach and went for a go around. Uh, and why this is important, in particular the altitude, the rate of ascent and the airspeed, it tells us something about stabilized approaches, which are a major theme in aircraft safety and can contribute to aircraft accidents. And that is likely one of the things that was part of the decision making the crews were considering at the time of the go around decision. Okay, I've put together a very basic diagram here of an approach to land with an airplane on finals, usually a three degree approach path, meaning the aircraft would descend 300 feet for every nautical mile of lateral distance, and they would be on that approach path, normally from about 3,000 feet above the runway, sometimes from a bit lower and sometimes from higher, and they would continue that flight path uh, with, in the later stages, their gear down, flaps in landing configuration and constant airspeed until they crossed the threshold at 50 feet, uh, came in towards an aim point on the runway, either 1,000 to 1,300 feet down the runway, which is equivalent to about 300 to 400 meters. So that really is the final phase of the landing approach in a simplistic viewpoint. And next we'll take a look about what stabilized approach is in Boeing terminology and why it matters. 
Okay, firstly, we're gonna take a look at the flight crew training manual for the 737 MAX, the aircraft I trained on 12 months ago, noting that the 737-800 was the accident aircraft, so an older NG variant. Okay, stabilize approach recommendations. Uh, maintaining a stable speed, descent rate, and vertical and lateral flight path in landing configuration is commonly referred to as a stabilized approach concept. Any significant deviation from planned flight path, airspeed, or descent rate should be announced by the crew, that would be. The decision to execute a go around is not an indication of poor performance. Do not attempt to land from an unstable approach. So some very clear guidance, some very clear direction almost that pilots are not to land from unstable approaches. And importantly, making a decision to go around is not a sign of making an error or poor flying. It can be due to a range of factors. Okay, so what are the actual elements of a stabilized approach for a 737 MAX? We looked at the diagram just a moment ago. We looked at the three degree line into landing. Uh, the flight crew training manual here says that all approaches should be stabilized by, by 1,000 feet above the field in IMC or cloudy weather and 500 feet above the field in visual or clear weather. An approach is considered stabilized when all the following criteria are met and this is something the pilots will certainly have in mind as they approach the runway. The aircraft is on the correct flight path. Only small changes in heading and pitch are required to maintain the correct flight path. The airplane should be at approach speed, deviations of plus 10 knots to minus five knots are acceptable if the airspeed is trending towards the approach speed. The airplane is in the correct landing configuration. Well, that would mean that gear and flaps are in the configuration needed for landing. Sink rate or rate of descent is no greater than 1,000 feet per minute. If an approach requires a sink rate greater than 1,000 feet per minute, a special briefing should be conducted. Thrust setting is appropriate for the airplane configuration and all briefings and checklists have been conducted. Again, if the above criteria cannot be established and maintained until approaching the flare that's above the runway and initi initiate a go around. So a clear direction there to initiate a go around. So it's worth taking a quick look across to a different set of stable approach criteria. This one from Emirates, and this goes back about 15 years ago, noting that this criteria really hasn't changed dramatically in, in the industry in that period. Uh, the document says here, stable approach criteria, an approach is considered stable when all the following conditions are met. All briefings and checklists have been actioned. The aircraft is in the planned landing configuration. The aircraft is on the correct flight path. The aircraft speed is not more than final approach speed plus 10 knots and not less than VREF or the reference speed for approach. And power setting is appropriate for aircraft configuration. So a similar set of criteria there. And if we take a look at the altitude trend here of the aircraft with the distance from the runway, it's quite clear the aircraft is getting low and below the ideal glide path in here towards this point, 2.4 nautical miles, 525 feet, especially if you consider the uh, slight elevation of the airport above sea level and also the 50 foot crossing height. So the aircraft was trending low, which is to be expected really given this increased rate of descent. Okay, this document is the Unstable Approaches uh, Risk Mitigation Policies, Procedures and Best Practices, second edition. So a guide to the industry and pilots by the International Air Transport Association, uh, looking at some data through to about 2016 when this document was released. Um, section 2.3 here, data analysis, says that of the total of 470 commercial aircraft accidents recorded by IATA Accident Database during the period of 2011 to 2015, so a four-year window there, 267 or 65% occurred during the approach and landing phase, and 31 of these involved fatalities. So a large portion were during approach and landing, and a large factor there is unstable approaches. The document says below here, stable approaches significantly increase the chances of landing safely. Ensuring a stable approach is the first line of defense available to crews against accidents in the critical flight phases of an approach and landing. And we can see specifically here that of the flight data in that four year period, runway and taxiway excursions accounted for 30% of the approach and landing accidents and gear up landing or gear collapse 23%. Now clearly that was a factor at the end of this flight for Jeju 2216. So the key question being asked really is, even though the aircraft may have been in an unstable approach at the time and ordinarily a go-around would have been accomplished, given the bow strike and potential engine and other system damage, wouldn't it be advisable to continue the landing regardless? Wasn't the aircraft safer on the ground than in the air? So to look into that question a bit more deeply, it's worth taking a look at some technical information on the Boeing 737 and the start of this is really presented by Chris Brady in terms of his Boeing 737 technical site, which is excellent. There is the URL, uh, and this is a discussion of the Boeing 737 wing, but for the purposes of the video today, we're just looking essentially at the, uh, the wing view with the leading edge flaps, leading edge slats, and the rear uh, flaps towards the right of this diagram here. 
So we're gonna take a look at how they function and we're gonna take a look at the drag properties when the aircraft's coming into land. Uh, this is from Chris Brady's Flaps and Slats module and it takes a look at the differences in the wing and the characteristics between the early stages of flap slat deployment towards the later stages. Uh, the key point to note is that with a flaps to slats up configuration, once we start extending uh, flaps and slats, we get an increase in wing area, but mostly an increase in lift. It's only in the latter stages towards the normal landing flap configurations, 25, 30, 40, that really we get a lot more drag relative to the increase in lift. Uh, this really illustrates the point. Flap five, which is a normal takeoff flap setting, it gives an increase in effective wing area for approximately 17%. That's flap five here. And flap 40, a maximum flap setting, gives approximately 22% increase over clean wing. So only 5% increase in wing area, but a major increase in drag. So what does this extra drag in the landing flap configuration give us? Well, a few things. Firstly, from a flap five position, when we go to a landing flap position of, let's say flap 30, it gives us a center of pressure move, which allows the aircraft nose to be lowered for a better forward view of the runway. It really significantly lowers the pitch attitude and increases pilot visibility at the front of the aircraft. It clearly lowers the approach speed by giving us a lower stall speed. And importantly, that drag requires greater engine thrust. Now it's kind of counterintuitive. And early in my career, I didn't really realize the purpose for this. But a big factor in higher drag demands late in the approach with landing flap is that the engines need to spool up and provide a lot more thrust, meaning they're a lot more responsive if a go around is needed. And as you may know, different to a car engine, a turbine engine at idle or very low power settings requires a lot of time to spool up, a lot of time to create power and thrust before it's able to safely get that aircraft away. So in a landing flap configuration, it is really handy to have drag out and have the engines providing a significant amount of power to thrust that aircraft and propel it away from the ground as and when needed. And to give you an indication of the extent of this, I've captured a video here which is from a flight simulator, not an actual NG or 800 aircraft, but it is very useful for giving an indication of the different power which is required at different flight configurations, noting it's indicative only, it is not based on a simulator or actual flight data. However, it is modeled and it is useful for the purposes of the video. All right, so early in descent here, about 2,800 feet, on approach to land, we're on an ILS approach. We've got flaps set at 15, so not seeing a lot of drag relative to lift at this point in time. Airspeed set to 160 with autopilot on, that's coming back to 160. And we can see power here on both engines in terms of our uh, N1 sitting at about 48, 49%. Airspeed stable at 162 through about 2,300 feet. And now airspeed's coming back and flaps being selected from 15 all the way down to 30, which is a common landing flap configuration. So 152 is being set, which is just above VREF. Fairly common landing speed. Speed's still coming back, still coming back, still coming back. Flaps are now at 30 and the speed is starting to stabilize. Just watch where the N1 goes to, which gives an indication of our thrust requirements. So through 1,700 feet there, 151 knots, stabilizing airspeed and the power or the thrust is really coming up significantly, just over 60 now easing back. So much closer to 60 than the previous uh, 49 or 50% N1 ballpark. So 30, flap 30, about 57% N1 and a lower airspeed than we had with flaps 15. The reason why that's important and that's going to be a factor in the decision making of the crew is that engine damage, as we know, was a factor on this flight. It's quite clear that birds impacted one of the engines, uh, bird debris has been found within one, and from the video footage it appears that the second engine was also impacted. Why does that matter? Well, the Boeing guidance here for engine failure, you can read that as uh, failure or severe damage on final approach. It says here, noting this is for the MAX aircraft, not for the 800. If an engine failure should occur on final approach with flaps in the landing position, the decision to continue the approach or executed go around should be made immediately. If the approach is continued and sufficient thrust is available, continue the approach with landing flaps. If the approach is continued and sufficient thrust is not available for landing flaps, retract the flaps to 15 and adjust thrust on the operating engine. So there is an option here to reduce the flap setting and adjust the thrust. Then the pilot would revert to a single engine landing technique and use the thrust on the good remaining engine in part of the engine that is damaged or failed. The guidance we just saw was very clear about failure or even damage to one engine, but what about damage to multiple engines? 
We know that with flaps stored with landing configuration flaps 30, we're going to be feeling a lot more drag than with lower flap settings with damage to both engines. There's really a question in the pilot's mind as to whether that approach can be safely continued at all, even with lower flap setting. That may well have gave cause to a decision to make a go around. And if we take a look at the approach diagram that I put together earlier, and the fact that on a normal approach, you've only got 50 feet above the approach end of the runway when you're crossing it to land. So with damage to both engines and a deviation below flight path and profile, as we saw in the flight data here, the crew may well have found themselves in a situation where they were below the glide path with damage on both engines and with real doubt about whether that approach could be safely continued. A key concern may have been, even if they could stabilize glide path, would they have cleared the arrival end of the runway? Would they have landed short? It's really hard to say. What is clear is that engine damage was sustained most likely on both engines and that whilst below glide path, the decision to go around was made and the aircraft was positioned for a landing on, that, on the other runway. Now clearly hindsight would have been amazing for the crew, but that is not something we can factor in at the time. We can see here from when the stable descent rate ceased through to when the, what appears to be missed approach was attempted, about 30 seconds elapsed within which birds were most likely encountered. The pilots would have taken some time to adjust to that situation and some decisions would have been made. How would the crew have made that decision? Well, a good indication here is in some detailed human factors training that all airline crews receive globally. Here we're gonna take a look at the FAA's Excellent Pilots Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Chapter two, aeronautical decision-making. We're going to take a look at something called automatic or naturalistic decision-making, which you can see here on the right, as opposed to something called analytical decision-making. Now, analytical decision-making, many of you are probably aware of. We're gonna reference here the Australian Government Civil Aviation Safety Authority's excellent booklet here, The Safety Behaviors, Human Factors for Pilot Second Edition, based on decision-making. We're gonna take a look at some common frameworks many of you will be familiar with, things like grade, or safe. So their analytical frameworks will be used by crews that have several minutes, maybe even longer, often at higher altitude with autopilot engaged to really look at what problems they have, uh, analyze and examine the problem, address it, and then evaluate the results. So really analytically and step-by-step step going through a decision-making process. Uh, on late final approach, the crew in this instance just didn't have time for that. They would have used what's known as automatic or naturalistic decision-making. Okay, the FAA document goes on to say automatic decision making. Rather than comparing the pros and cons of different approaches, they quickly imagine, so crews quickly imagine, how one or a few possible courses of action in such situations will play out. Experts take the first workable option they can find. While it may not be the best of all possible choices, it often yields remarkably good results. It appears the expert's ability hinges on the recognition of patterns and consistencies that clarify options in complex situations. This is a reflexive type of decision making anchored in training and experience and is the most and is most often used in times of emergencies when there is no time to practice analytical decision-making. So that precisely would have been the situation the crew found themselves in. There was no time to consider deeply all factors of that decision. It was something that would have come down to training, experience, and a fairly rapid assessment of risk to the flight and of the risk to the passengers and the crew at that point in time. So while we might have hindsight, the crew on the day did not. They needed to make a decision on the basis of the information they had at the time, not on consideration of what would have occurred several minutes later. So that is it for the video. We've looked at a few things today. We've looked at the stable approach, the criteria of the stable approach, why it's important. We've looked at the flight profile, the drag required with high flap settings, and why a decision to go around would be different when there's damage on both engines. Thank you for watching through to now. I hope you've enjoyed this and hope it's shed some light on some of the complicated decision-making criteria pilots need to consider in difficult situations such as this. If you found value in this video, please subscribe, share the video with someone else, and I really benefit from hearing your comments on what you've appreciated, what I can improve, and importantly, any areas or oversights I may have made, so please comment below. Okay, thank you for supporting Adaptive Aviator, and I look forward to seeing you again in a future video soon.